Tonight, do I have everyone's rapt attention? <laughs> Tonight, we're going to be looking at the eighth of the commandments, and I've already given the game away about what that is. And ah, yes. you must not steal yes. is the commandment. Now, you will remember that David, some weeks ago, I think David's with Caleb right now. Maybe there he is. There he is. Very good. Um, he showed us some illustrations that he learned as a child to help remember the Ten Commandments in order. So there's an eight hidden in that picture. Can everybody see oh, it? <laughs> yes, it's it's the uh, it's the bandit mask. All right, so. The first point that we need to make here is that God's ideal is that we all contribute to society by making an honest living. Am I in your way, Murray? <laughs> perhaps you could move your seat, perhaps. <laughs> Ephesians 4.28 says, if you're a thief, quit stealing. <laughs> Sorry, I just... The Monty Python, stop it, just stop. <laughs> if you're a thief, quit stealing. Use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. So we can begin by affirming that God's law is good. Because we all want to live in the kind of society where no one needs to lock their doors, fear that their wallet won't be returned, where you have to watch out for scams and phishing online, pyramid schemes. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't this be a great place to live if you didn't have any of that stuff to worry about? What if everyone had a job and could feel good about themselves and could afford to be generous? Don't you want to go live in that place? And this is God's ideal. This is part of the picture of the good life that we are meant to enjoy here on earth. And if sin hadn't come along, we would be living that good life right now. When I moved from moved to New Zealand from South Africa some 20 odd years ago, um, I was just amazed because back in the day, you could get your New Zealand Herald you know, out one of those things and you just put your money in the slot but you could just take the paper. You guys had honesty boxes. I haven't seen too many of those lately, but they were <laughs> honesty boxes and they were still delivering milk. It was kind of in the final days of that, but I mean, people had their bottles with money out on the pavement. And I kept thinking, I could just take that. I could just, I realized I'd been trained to think like a criminal because of where I came from, right? where you had to lock everything up and you wouldn't dream about, you know, putting something out. You know, walking along and someone's dropped something and someone just popped it on the wall so that they'd see it and find it when they came back. And I'm thinking, I could just take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I've calmed down and New Zealand has stopped being quite that wonderful place. Let me tell you. Tell you. <laughs> So, I mean, there's my feel-good message, in a way, and I could end this message right now, and it wouldn't be wrong to do so, because that's what God wants, and, and let's make it so, right? But there are some uncomfortable real-world real world questions around the matter of stealing, which perhaps we need to explore. Uh, and I wanted to say this, the law of the land only gets you so far. Now, I just put down section 219 of the Crimes Act, which deals with stealing, all right? So there's a legal definition of stealing. And, um, you know, does that help us? Well, it gets us some of the way, but it only gets us so far. You see, the world we live in does not yet resemble the kingdom of God. And every country on earth has laws around stealing. Because we have to, right? Whatever their religious beliefs, whatever their uh, philosophical persuasion, every country has laws around stealing. But criminal law has its limitations. 
Perhaps one of the reasons I kept thinking like a criminal when I came here was uh, one of my jobs in South Africa before arriving here was as a public prosecutor. <laughs> and, and I prosecuted hundreds of people for theft and many other crimes. And the first question we had to answer was not what would be fair and right and just in this case. That wasn't the question. Because our system of law was was not what is known in legal theory as natural law. In natural law, you say, what's the ethical solution that we're looking for here? But South Africa and this country and every other Western country practices what's known as positive law. They don't care what feels good or you know what your conscience might dictate. The simple question is, what does the law state? And have you, do you tick the boxes? Yeah. If, if, if you tick every box in this statement, well, then you're going to be found guilty of theft. End of story. And what your extenuating circumstances were, well, we might look at that at the end of the trial, but right now, you're going to be found guilty if you tick the box on every one of those, every one of those statements. So, here's the problem. The law looks at an incident. They don't, it doesn't look at your life. You're judged on external behavior, not your heart motivation. And the law punishes individuals that fall within the law and lets others go free that fall outside of it, even though what they are doing is maybe worse. Right? What about this guy? Anyone recognize his face? He has the kind of face you really feel like smacking. <laughs> so Martin Martin Skrilli was a hedge fund manager and the CEO of a pharmaceutical firm called Turing Pharmaceuticals. And back in September 2015, and you may remember the story, Turing obtained the manufacturing license for the antiparasitic drug Daraprim. And Martin Skrilli raised his price by 5,455% from $13.50 per pill to 750 bucks per pill. The world was an uproar. I mean, it was headline news in every paper around the world. And of course, if you were someone that needed that drug, if your insurance wouldn't pay up, you were toast. Now, by any narrow definition of theft, Mr. Screlly was in the clear. He owned the license. He owned the patent. If he wanted to raise the drug price 5,000%, he was allowed to. The system says, that's okay. But what do you think? Did he break the Eighth Commandment or not? What do you think? Uh, now, Schadenfreude... Two years later, he went to jail, but not for this. He went, <laughs> he went to jail on securities fraud um, and for conspiring to commit securities fraud. And he got sentenced to seven years in jail. But it wasn't about Daraprim. It was about another law where he ticked the boxes and he ended up going to jail. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask, who's the bigger thief? I mentioned earlier that I come from a country of some extremes. And, um, and when South African news kind of floats up, I tend to take note of it because, you know, I come from there. You understand. Now, on a scale of perceived corruption, measured by the organization Transparency.org, New Zealand gets a one, which is really good. There are like three countries in the world that get a one. We're one of the least corrupt nations of, on earth. That's the perception. Of, um, of people, maybe we're just stupid, but <laughs> but we perceive our government as being very, very non-corrupt. That's the word. <laughs> South Africa gets a seventy, right, <laughs> which is the bottom half of the table, and it's sinking. So, not doing so very well. Now, the president of South Africa is presently facing a scandal. Because among the many properties he owns is a luxury game farm. And recently, 
the residence on this farm was burgled and a lot of money stolen. Now, rather than call the cops officially and get the local plod, you know, to come in and then the newspapers would get the story and whatever, he called the higher-ups, he called the cop bosses and said, could you just take care of this quietly for me? And they said, sure, boss. And they did. And no one quite knows what happened to those burglars, whether they're alive or dead, because they, they just like disappeared and no one knows anything about them. So let me ask you this awkward question. When the government is corrupt and wealth has accumulated in the hands of an elite few to the detriment of ordinary people, who is the bigger thief? The person with the luxury home or the person breaking in who has nothing else to lose? Who's the bigger thief? And then let me ask you this, whose side will the law take? Yeah. This is a slight digression, but allow me to take it. The Bible is clear that stealing is never right, but there is compassion for the desperate in the Bible. And we've got this, this verse from Proverbs 6. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he is starving. Yet, if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it costs him all the wealth of his house. Well, let me just say, if you're starving to death and you can't afford to buy a loaf of bread, you can probably take seven times. You know, come to my house, find the seven times wealth. If I could have found it, I would have bought the loaf of bread myself. Right. So it sounds tough, but actually, you know, it's not so bad, is it? <laughs> The context of this verse in Proverbs is actually a discourse on adultery, which Murray spoke about last week. And what the guy in Proverbs is really getting at is this. Look, if someone steals and he's starving, we're all going to go, poor guy. I mean, we, we, we kind of understand. We have compassion on that. But if you commit adultery, no one's sorry for you. You've only got yourself to blame. Uh, there's no excuse for adultery. There might be an excuse to steal something because you're hungry, but adultery is a different kettle of fish altogether. So that's the context of this verse of Proverbs. Who thinks hungry people caught stealing bread should go to jail? Put your hand. Who thinks hungry people caught stealing bread should be sent to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> So, of course, so of course that really happened, right? It was an example of the letter of the law being applied without any compassion at all. And now I'm going to take a little aside from a little aside. <laughs> Some people think God does that. They think that when it comes to sin, God has no sense of proportion. God doesn't distinguish between the desperate and the desperately wicked. Any sin, great or small, is the same in the eyes of God. Some people believe that and they teach that. Those that believe this, I think, are confusing things. Yes, we are all sinners needing God's grace and forgiveness. And even the best of us cannot enter the kingdom outside of a relationship with Jesus. But the question on Judgment Day will not be, did you steal something? But do you know Jesus? That's, that's going to be the question, right? God is merciful. God is just. And if he had no sense of proportion about our sin, he'd be neither merciful nor just. If it, would, if it would offend your sense of justice to treat a murderer and someone who stole an apple equally harshly, then you can't trust that God's sense of justice, you can't trust God's sense of justice at all, can you? But God's sense of justice is even keener than ours. The Bible is clear that God, who knows every little thing about us, will be our fair and our righteous judge. All right. Back from the aside, on the aside, on the aside. <laughs> Why is theft wrong? Whatever the circumstances, even the verse from Proverbs says, you know, you're going to be punished because theft is wrong. Even if you were starving and you took something, it still wasn't right. So why is theft wrong, whatever our circumstances? Perhaps we stole because we were motivated by greed. 
Bible has a lot to say about avarice and greed and wanting to just grab stuff for yourself. Perhaps we are motivated by a lack of faith. We, we thought, God is not going to take care of me in my circumstances. And so I've got to take care of myself. And so I will steal something because that's the only way I think I'm going to get by. But here's, here's probably the biggie. When I steal something, I'm not demonstrating love for my neighbor. And that is really the heart of the matter. So Jesus says this. Well, actually, this wasn't the Jesus one. I changed it. This is Paul speaking in Romans 13, 9. For the commandments say you must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not covet. These and other such commandments are summed up in this one commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. This gets to the heart of the matter. The law of the land can only deal in surface facts, but God intended his law to be written on our hearts. Instead of a list of negatives, don't do this, don't do that, the law becomes something positive that flows from our heart. The great commandment is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I've got the orders a bit, a bit wrong there, maybe. <laughs> and love your neighbor as yourself. Martin Shkreli may not have broken the law, but he was not loving his neighbor as himself, was he? And when through graft and nepotism, country leaders amass great wealth, they're not loving their neighbors as they love themselves, even if there are no laws to stop them. And what about those in desperate need? If we loved our neighbor as we loved ourselves, we would find ways of helping them so that they didn't have to steal to survive. You know, in the story of Ruth in the Bible, we learn how it was customary in Israel to leave some of the crop behind at uh, harvest time, to allow the poor a chance to gather enough for themselves to eat. Instead of causing people to sin through theft, they earn God's blessing by being generous. Loving our neighbors as ourselves would transform our world overnight. So, how should we live in light of this commandment? And the first point I'd like to make is, perhaps we need to make amends. Proverbs 28, 13 says, People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. Now, there are some commands that very few of us have broken, probably, like murder. However, the command not to steal is not one of those. I would wager we've all been guilty of pinching something somewhere along the line. Maybe we don't want to think about it, but I'd like us to take a moment to do just that. Think about something you've nicked sometime in your life. I'm going to give you a second longer. <laughs> However small or trivial the incident or value of the item, you may have a troubled conscience about something you've taken sometime in your life. You don't have to tell us about it tonight. We'll let you off this time. <laughs> but if your conscience is pricking you, what can you do about it? So, well, you can start by telling God you're sorry. All right? Get on the same page with God and admit this was wrong. And I am sorry. Tell the person you stole from that you're sorry, if you still can. They may have died, they may have passed on, you may have be completely out of touch. But if you can, tell them you're sorry. You know, they'll be amazed. They'll be absolutely stunned, especially if this was 20 years ago. If you still have the object, can you give it back? Is there someone <laughs> with a greater right to the object than you have? Can you give it to them? And if nicking things is an ongoing problem for you, Find an accountability partner to help keep you safe. So that, that's, that's my first point. My second point is we need to rid our hearts of greed. 
1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. The funny thing is, the things we take are not often of high value. Those office supplies from work, that apple from the supermarket, could we have bought them for ourselves? Most of the time, of course we could have. If we could just have bought them, why didn't we? And some of us are putting our souls in danger just to save a buck. In the light of eternity, what's a buck? Hey, people? But it's really the same reason someone steals a million dollar necklace. We end up with more money in the bank. That's really what we're thinking about. If I take it and I don't have to pay for it, I, I get to keep the money. We want stuff we don't want to pay for or can't pay for. Greed is really the bottom line here. Wanting stuff. We need to rid our hearts of greed. And then we need to trust God with our needs. Jesus says in Matthew 6, that, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them, and aren't you far more valuable than they are? So what about the person stealing just to get basic needs met? Now, if the reason you have no money for food is because your money is going on an addiction, well, then that's the problem, right? We don't have to spiritualize it. Do what you need to do to overcome your addiction with God's help so that you can stop stealing. But when you're really up against it and tempted to steal just to get your basic needs met, then is the time to hold on to your faith. These verses from Matthew tell us that God sees our situation and cares deeply about it. He feeds and clothes the birds and animals, and we are far more valuable to him than they are. What do you think Jesus means when he says, life is more than food and the body more than clothing? You know, without food and without warm clothing, we're going to expire, we're going to die. Yes, God knows that. But a life of integrity that honors God by expressing faith and trust in him is worth more than mere existence. When we dishonor God's name by stealing, mere existence is all we're left with. Don't settle for that. Psalm 37 verse 25 says, Once I was young and now I am old, yet I've never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. I've never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. So have faith. Don't give up hope of God's rescue. And if I ever find myself in this terrible situation, I pray that by God's grace, I will remember these words myself. The fourth point, practice generosity. And again, Jesus in Luke 6, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Stealing is all about taking and getting. But we're called to be imitators of Christ, who modeled giving his life away for the sake of others. Jesus says in this passage that when we choose to live generously, a strange God-ordained law kicks in. The more we give, the more we get. Not just the same things coming back to us, but the gifts of love and friendship and support, support in our own infirmities, a helping hand when we need it. The more generous you are, the more lavish the kindness you will receive in return. Stealing, grabbing and getting has the opposite effect. We lose goodwill and friends and company and people close their hearts to us. So let us learn from Jesus to live a life of a hand open to others rather than holding on to what we've got with all our might, wishing we had even more. And then my last point. Hey, aren't you glad to hear that? Music to your ears. 
We need to stand up to the poor being robbed by the system. You know, earlier I pointed out that we can't count on the law to bring about justice. The law keeps the world running on its course. But what if the game is rigged? What if the dice are loaded so that the rich get richer at the expense of everyone else? You don't have to believe in conspiracies and shadowy cabals to see that this is in fact the case. We don't just have individual thieves. There's also systemic evil that is robbing billions of people of their fair share of this world's wealth and resources. You know, many people associate communism with atheism and the persecution of Christians, and then just blindly assume that capitalism must be the Christian way. Capitalism turns greed and consumerism into a virtue. I somehow doubt that Jesus would have been a fan of the system. But because it's just the water we swim in, we can be guilty of turning a blind eye to the evils of an economic system that benefit us at the expense of other people, other nations, of the entire planet. What does God think of these statistics up on the screen? Half of the world's net wealth belongs to the top 1%. The top 10% of adults hold 85% of the world's wealth, while the bottom 90% hold the remaining 15% of the world's total wealth. And the top 30% of adults in the world hold 97% of the total wealth. That leaves 3% of the world's wealth or 70% of people. What does God think of taking from the poor to make the rich richer? Let's look at some verses together. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. <coughs> Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Do not rob the poor because he is poor or crush the afflicted at the gate. For the Lord will plead their cause and rob of life those who rob them. This is what the Lord says. Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor, the one who has been robbed. Do not wrong or do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. Those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. Do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the alien, or the poor, and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. So, so what can you and I do about that? The problem is way bigger than us. You know, the problem is the whole world. What can you and I do? So I've got just three quick ideas for us. We need to gain some awareness of this issue. We're not all one global village, one happy fam family, all living the good life together. There are people making sacrifices of environment, sacrifices of health, sacrifices of family, so you and I can have our smartphones and our lovely life. Start reading about the issue. Start asking questions. See what the Lord says to your heart. And then we need to start making some ethical choices around the food we eat and the clothes we wear. Did the people who farmed or made the stuff we, we consume, did they get dignity? Did they get a fair wage for it? Because if we're always going to choose what is the cheapest, whatever, then you're only concerned about your own bank account, right? And we need to make do with less. Let's stop the madness of needing stuff and acquiring stuff all the time. It's feeding the same monster that drives the thief to steal. Let's do what we can do in God's strength to slay that monster in our own life. And I'm getting very near the end now. <laughs> Let's do a little recap. Who can remember the first thing I said about how should we live in light of this commandment? What was the first thing I said? Yes? Make amends. Well done. And then, what did I say after that? <laughs> Oh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Sorry? Greed. Greed, yeah. Red of hearts are greed. greed. And then what did I say? Uh, trust God with our needs. Well done. And then, yes, Murray, practice generosity. 
And then the last one. Yeah, stand up for the poor. Okay. I'll, I'll get a score from Murray later about how well I did with the sermon. But for now, you have a table discussion. And here it is. Discuss this proverb. Discuss how this proverb relates to the message you just heard. And the proverb is this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. For if I grow rich, I may deny you and say, who is the Lord? And if I'm too poor, I may steal and thus insult God's holy name. All right, I want you to discuss that problem at your table in light of the message.